Hello again, fellow audiophiles. I am Wave Theory, and this is the Niche Pietus Maximus. This is a 500 US dollar headphone amplifier that is modular so that you can add internal DAC cards, which you can also order from Niche, but are made by shit. There is an ESS DAC card option that uh, adds about $150 to the price, and then there is a uh, Multibit 2 uh, DAC card option, which adds about $250. $250 to the price. This was a channel purchase. Uh, it came from channel funds, so this was not sent to be to me by niche or by shit, uh, with one exception. I did buy the Multibit 2 DAC card to come with it, and then in talking to the folks over at niche during the course of this review, they ve very graciously sent over a loaner unit of the ESS DAC card as well. So I get to report to you on both of those throughout the course of this review. However, other than talking about some of the design choices that were made in this unit, the folks over at Niche have made no attempt to influence my opinion on this piece in one way or the other, so all of the thoughts you are about to hear are mine and mine alone. And I really enjoyed uh, getting to know this amp and listening to it. I really enjoyed listening to music through it. So stick around after shameless self-promotion to find out why. Hi, I'm Wave Theory's Human Companion, and he wants you to know that your support of this YouTube channel helps keep the reviews coming. If you enjoy Wave Theory's honest, thorough style, then make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and check out the links in the description below to sign up for the Patreon or send him a tip through PayPal. All right, enjoy the musings. Once again, we are going to be here a while because there is a lot to discuss in this uh, about this amplifier here uh, because I've got I have both DAC modules to talk about and how they perform in this unit and then also like where it fits into the market. And that's a very interesting question that we'll unpack throughout this review as well. But as I said there uh, before shameless self-promotion, I did ultimately really enjoy listening to this headphone amp and getting to know it. It sounds really good at its price point. It has a very warm, smooth, and very refined, surprisingly well-refined sound for the price point. And it also has a good amount of sub-bass impact and slam and that sort of thing. And really the only complaint that I have about it is that it is a single-ended only device. And I think at this price, it is a little bit awkward for it to be that way. Um, and I will unpack all of that uh, as we proceed through the review. So there's kind of your little preview and the general takeaways uh, um, on this unit here uh, to uh, hopefully get you to stick around and listen to why I say all of those things. But we have to talk about the sound of the amp. We have to talk about the sound of each DAC module here. Then we also have to talk about comparisons with other amplifiers. And I have with me my own shit Asgard 3 to do a comparison with. I have with me my own Lake People G111 Mark II to do a comparison with. And then also I will talk about like what you gain by jumping up to the next amplifier tier here because I still have in-house the Vielectric HPA V222. And I also have the Shit Molnir 3 in for review as well. So those two amps are like comfortably in a performance tier um, kind of above this one and the G111. And so again, what do you gain by jumping up to that level? that this doesn't give you. We'll talk about that um, as well. All right, so let's start with uh, getting into some, uh, uh, like what is the niche uh, Pietus Maximus? And then also we'll get into some specs in the build and that sort of thing. All right, just see my link uh, to Niche's website in the description down below for the full story here. But just a quick summary of how this thing came to be. Um, there is a pretty close relationship between the company Niche and then the company Shit. And you can see that because like, I mean, here I'll hold the Asgard 3 up again. You can see the aesthetic similarities in like the build of the chassis and all that too between these two. So there's a very tight relationship between those two companies. And Niche initially launched, uh, I think it was called the Magni Piety, which I have reviewed and I will put a link to that review in the description down below. 
And uh, that was like Niche's take on um, Shit's entry-level headphone amp line, the Magni. And the, the Magni Piety was kind of known for having this warmer and thicker and more stereotypically tube-like kind of sound there at the entry level. So what Jason Stoddard of Shit did is he took those Magni Piety ideas and he scaled them up. He got a higher quality potentiometer, higher quality capacitors, a higher quality power supply, things like that, and came up with the general idea for what eventually became the Pietus Maximus here. So when Stoddard shared his uh, what he came up with, with the uh, Niche team, they were excited about it and they wanted to launch it as their own um, headphone amp line. So they took his ideas, they refined them a little bit, did a couple of iterations and did some fine tuning and all of that and came up with this product here. All right, so again, 500 US dollars here just for the amp only. If you order it with the ESS DAC module, that runs the price up to 650 US dollars. And if you order it with the Multibit 2 module, that runs the price up to 750 US dollars. And you can come back and buy either of those DAC modules, either from Niche or from Shit on your own later on and swap them out to your heart's content. It's not a particularly difficult or onerous process to do that DAC card swapping in there either. All right, uh, just for reference, these DAC cards are the same that are available that go into the, uh, the Asgard 3 here or the Jotunheim 2 amps from shit, by the way, just uh, in case you were curious about that. All right, specs on this amplifier. At a 32 ohm load, it is rated at 4.8 watts per channel of, or excuse me, 4.2 watts per channel, I should say, uh, of output power. And then that becomes 320 milliwatts per channel at a 600 ohm output. So there is a fair amount of power on tap here. All right, and then we'll kind of uh, get into the unit tour here and then use that to explain some of the other features. So. Front panel, again, we see the shit aesthetic going on here just with a different color scheme with this gray and the black volume knob here, all of that. So just it's on the uh, the same chassis that is for the Asgard, Jotunheim, Bifrost, Lyre series in there. And I think also the Saga series uses this case as well, all that. So it's a, it's a common design from shit that Niche borrowed and put their own uh, aesthetic, at least their own color scheme on here too. Front panel, pretty straightforward. Forward. We have the volume knob here. Here's the one place where you see a shit logo on this thing. And then we have a gain switch right here. There are three gain stages to this, a 0.3, a 1.0, and a 5.2, I think it is, something like that, which basically just means low, medium, and high. And medium is like kind of just like the unity gain kind of thing as I understand it, like right in there, the 1.0 level. Then right here we have an input selector switch where you can switch between the internal DAC module or the RCA input on the back. And then we have the quarter inch slash 6.35 millimeter single ended headphone output right here. Round back, okay, power input, power switch. Okay, this is the classic shit move. Okay, the company shit and now by extension niche pretty much always puts their power switches on the back here or at least niche does for the units that they borrow heavily of the design from shit anyway. Okay, um, on this unit that is really not a problem because I think most people are going to leave this powered on pretty much all of the time and it does get a little bit warm but really never hot so it's perfectly safe to leave it running and all that and not have to reach around behind to flip this on and off. Then we have two sets of stereo RCA um, uh, connections here. This one right here is the pre-out, so you can use this as a pre-amplifier. This one right here is the input to bypass the uh, internal DAC card and just go right into the amp. And then here is the USB-C input for the DAC module. And in the unit right now, I have installed the multi-bit DAC module. More on that in a little bit. Okay, otherwise, it is a well-built unit. It is fairly heavy. A lot of that comes from the linear power supply um, that is internal here, which is fairly beefy and does a fairly good job from what I can tell uh, in there. But I mean, it, it's got fine build quality and that sort of thing, but otherwise it's a pretty simple device. Single analog input, a pre-output, and then a spot to put in a modular DAC card, which gives you a USB-C input. Okay. 
I think at this point we should talk a little bit about um, ergonomics in that sort of thing because we'll go ahead and get this out of the way. Um, my least favorite aspect about this product is one that if you watch my channel, you are familiar with, and that is that it only has single-ended connections. It's perfectly fine with me that it's a single-ended amplifier and a single-ended device. Again, if you've watched my channel, you've heard me say this before, a balanced circuit topography, at least in terms of audio, is not inherently uh, sonically superior to a single-ended circuit topology. In theory, the reverse is actually true because with a single-ended design, you need to buy fewer parts. Parts meaning capacitors, resistors, transistors, circuit elements, that kind of thing. You need to buy fewer parts, which at a fixed price point means that in theory you can buy better parts, which would lead to an overall better sounding device. So it being single-ended on its own is not a problem. Where I need to ding it is that it has no balanced input. I'm going to pull out the Lake People G111 Mark II real quick because this one currently sells for 550 US dollars. It was a 599 US dollar product when I first when it first launched, but I think about 550 right now is kind of the going rate on this. And it's also a single-ended amplifier, but it has a balanced input on the back. So it does a pretty pretty good job internally of doing balanced to single-ended conversion. Uh, in there. Now somebody is inevitably going to comment down below that the reason that the G111 Mark II has that is because it is designed to be more of a professional use headphone amplifier and in a lot of professional audio situations they used balanced connections. And uh, that's true. I'm sure that's why it has the balanced input on it. But that does not change my point at all that here is a device pretty close to the price of this one that has effective uh, balance to single ended conversion internally and all of that. And uh, so that to me is saying like I that is an aspect that I think this thing uh, sorely misses. Now the presence of the DAC modules here partially address the issue that this thing lacking a balanced input has but they don't go all the way. Okay which we'll unpack a little bit more here in just a moment. But why is this an issue? Well, the DAC market around this price point, so again, this is a $500 amp right here. The DAC market between 200 and about 1,000 US dollars in there is just really flooded right now with balanced DACs. And those balanced DACs sound better from their balanced outputs than they do from their single-ended outputs. And that, again, does not, uh, is not because balanced is inherently better, but it is because those devices are built and designed around being balanced. So they naturally do sound better from their balanced outputs. And some kind of circuit kajiggering had to happen to produce their single-ended outputs. And I have yet to hear a single one of those devices where that circuit kajiggering does not cause the single-ended output to have some sort of performance hit. Okay, can't name one right now. Right, um, so that puts the, the Pietus Maximus in a bit of an awkward position because in terms of matching to external DACs, you've got really limited options. One I have right here, that's the Cord Mojo 2. One is like the Socrus DAC 1421 and the other one is the Black Ice Audio Glass FX. Um, in there too. And so, but I mean, na start naming DACs under a thousand US dollars that are balanced and you're going to get to more than three really, really fast. So the one complaint that I have here about this, um, this amplifier, again, it sounds great and we are going to get to its sound here in a moment, is that it just is a little bit awkward in the market because of that lack of balanced input. It makes your life a little bit more difficult. You as a potential buyer makes your life a little bit more difficult into matching this to and procuring a DAC that um, is single-ended and performs well from its single-ended output you know, around this price point. The DAC modules that come with it, I mentioned just a little bit ago, are only, partial, uh, um, only partially address that problem. 
um, they do sound pretty good. And we'll talk about their sound here in a little bit, but they also bottleneck the performance of the amplifier. They do not squeeze out the performance that this thing is capable of, neither the ESS nor the multi-pit. Okay, do that. They also only have a USB-C input on there, and uh, so there's no SPDIF input uh, and, and that sort of thing. And then also, like they, uh, in terms of decoding options, they are from shit. So they top out at 24-bit, 192 kilohertz PCM file decoding, uh, no DSD. No MQA, even though that one is becoming less and less of a concern anymore, but no DSD and just, I mean, very limited options if you're into upsampling or want to explore upsampling or anything like that. So, I mean, it just, again, it tops out on 192 kilohertz and so forth. Um, another risk about having the USB-C only, um, only a USB connection on there is ground loop noise and system noise uh, bleeding in there because the Unison USB implementations on these things are at their best compatibility with like Windows 10 and 11, and I think they work okay with the Mac operating system, but I don't have that around to check. Um, but even so, like that does limit what you can plug these into. Like I tried plugging these into my, um, my uh, Samsung Galaxy S22 phone, which is doing the filming here and using the Rune Arc app uh, via USB. And like that would not, it would recognize the, the units in USB. Um, the Arc app would see it and recognize its name, but would refuse to output any sound. However, it did work with my iPad, my 10th gen iPad using the Rune Arc app. I was able to get lossless um, audio out of that through the Rune Arc app as well. But the point that I'm making here is these are only partial, partially address the issue of this being single-ended only because they do bottleneck the sound a little bit and they are very limited in terms of their input options and then also their compatibility has some potential limitations on it too. So those are all things that we need to keep in mind here. But here's where I'm going to stop complaining about that and turn it to the good parts of this, which is the sound, because this thing does sound very good. And I'm very excited to be able to talk to you about how good it does sound. So let's get into that. Test gear on this. As I mentioned, I used both DAC card modules here, and they um, each had a chance of being plugged directly into my Microsoft Surface Pro 4, which is a, um, a Windows 10 based laptop basically. And then that was used as its own Rune endpoint or sometimes I would use Ottervana right there uh, or to, to plug those in as the software player there as well. And then um, I also plugged the, uh, both USB modules into one of my Sonor Ultra Rendu streamers also being used as a Rune endpoint. All right. Um, all music files would have been lossless uh, FLAC or DSD files or high res FLAC files sourced locally, um, either Rune endpoint or played off a, a computer hard drive using Ottervana. Or I would stream uh, lossless FLAC files or high res FLAC files from Cobas, again, either through Rune or Ottervana. Outboard DACs that I tried with this thing include the Cord Mojo 2 and then using an AudioQuest Y cable to go from one of its 3.5 millimeter outputs into the RCA input here. Um, I also tried my Cord Hugo 2, uh, which was fed by its 2Go streamer, and then also um, the, my big gun, the Berkeley Alpha Series 2 DAC uh, that I have around using the single ended output of that into here as well. Um, if I used this or the, the Berkeley, it would have been fed by a Singer SU6, which was in turn fed by a Sonor Ultra Rendu streamer, again serving as a Rune endpoint. Headphones that I plugged into this are fairly numerous. They include a couple of high impedance dynamic driver headphones. Actually, three of them had a little bit of time on here. One would be my 300 ohm Sennheiser HD6XX, okay, the Masterop Sennheiser collab there. One of them is the 600 ohm Bayer Dynamic DT880. And then a third one, this one had the least time because it came in only very recently, but that would be the ZMF Atrium Closed, which I'm pretty sure is a 300 ohm unit as well. All right, um, I also plugged in an easy to drive dynamic driver, a low impedance dynamic driver headphone, that would be the Focal Radiance. 
then several planars uh, from Hi-Fi Man. I, so the Ananda Nano got time on here, the Aria Organic, the HE1000 Stealth Edition, the HE1000 SE, and let's see, what else did I try on there from them? That might have been it for the Hi-Fi Men's, but the Dan Clark Audio E3 also was used on here, and I had a, re a, re a review for that recently. And I tried my Focal Utopia on here, an original, just long enough to know that that was not a good pairing, so it didn't get any more time than that. Uh, and then I also tried the Mod House Tungsten, which I have right there, that purple thing, the gray and purple one right there, which I am working on a review for and is very difficult to drive. Tried to see if this could handle it, and it actually did an okay job. Controlled it fairly well, but um, it didn't really ever get it up to reference volume levels before this was completely maxed out and had nothing more to give, but it still sounded pretty clean and smooth up with it completely opened up like that. Okay, sound then. Let's uh, finally get into the sound. The goal that uh, Niche had, that shit and Niche had with the sound of this thing was to make it kind of a stereotypically tube-like sound, meaning a little bit warmer, thicker, smoother than true neutral is. If you're familiar with the sound of the Magni Piety, okay, from Niche, or Shit's own Asgard 3, that's the kind of sound that um, comes out of here from like a tonality standpoint. It is a little bit warmer than true neutral. It is a little bit thicker and smoother and laid back in its presentation than like say true neutral or maybe natural would be. Okay, um, but it has a very, very refined sound. There is a lot of hype out there about this amp saying that it, you know, sounds way too mature for its price and that it competes with amplifiers that are a lot more expensive than it is. And it doesn't do that. And I'll more on that when we get to comparisons in a moment. But I think one of the reasons that people are saying that is because the refinement on this piece here is unusually high for an amp of this price. It just has a very like buttoned up, put together, like kind of just a complete mature sound. Like it just, it sounds very grown up, in control, refined kind of a, a sound there um, with it. Now that does not mean that it's more resolving than its competition or that its resolution and its spatial presentation, all of that reaches up to the higher price tiers, no. Okay, but that refinement, I think, is what's probably causing a lot of people to get really excited about this one because I can't name a more refined sounding amp in like this 400 to 800 kind of dollar price range in there. I just, I can't name one. That really is kind of the standout sonic trait of this thing at this price. Now, another thing that to me that was impressive about the sound is that the sub bass is very potent. There is a lot of sub bass slam here. It has a very, again, like that, that refinement and that kind of laid back smooth presentation is present from the mid bass all the way up through the treble, but that really deep sub bass has a lot of attitude behind it and will hit pretty hard. Okay, does it hit harder than something like the G111? I'm not sure. It could be a psychoacoustic effect of just the dynamics here at the low end just stand out because the rest of it is a bit more laid back. But whatever the case is, like the sub bass dynamic impact is a standout feature of the sound of this thing as well. All right, but other than that, like, so it is a little bit warmer, thicker, and then again, stereotypically tube-like in its sound. And I emphasize stereotypical there because I think we as a community need to stop assuming that vacuum tube audio devices inherently sound warm and thick and smooth and laid back. That's not true. Tube audio devices have just as big of a range and just as much diversity in their sound as solid state audio devices. But I am saying stereotypically tube like here to communicate the fact that yes, this one does have that warmer, thicker, smoother kind of laid back sound that we commonly and stereotypically associate with tube amps and all that. So if you like that, here it is in solid state form. Okay. 
Now, so that's kind of the overall uh, viewpoint of the sound and, and the, of the frequency response, at least the perceived frequency response and the presentation. Some of the other technical aspects of it here, like the tonal balance of it is very strong. I didn't really, I, that, like the relationships between fundamental frequencies and their harmonics is pretty accurate and pretty natural because I didn't really pick up uh, on any kind of shout or honk or that sort of thing. Like sibilance on this thing, like sharp S's and T's is a virtual rarity. It usually only happens when it happens in the recording, like that kind of thing, that kind of, you know, stereo, you know, uh, cliche kind of statement, but it's true here. All right, and then like the spatial holography on it is also quite impressive, especially laterally. There's a good sense of imaging, placing sounds in the sound field well, and then separating those, like creating space between those sonic images. Okay, and I say laterally because at $500, it's not particularly great in the depth dimension. It's not flat or wall of sound, but there is, you, you can ring more out of the, in the depth dimension as you scale up in quality of, of source gear on this as well. Okay, so I think that like covers a lot of the sound of this on its own here, um, at least in terms of the amplifier. Let's talk a little bit, actually before we move on to that, let me just talk about the, the headphone matches here. Um, all of those headphones that I named a little bit ago, save the Utopia, which is just a cranky um, uh, headphone and did not like this amplifier, and that's nothing to feel bad about niche. Utopia does that to a lot of amps, okay? Um, other than that, and the fact that it doesn't quite have the power to really push a tungsten or an HE6 SEV2 or a Susvara, like those kind of really extremely hard to drive planar models here, everything else that I tried Sounded really good on this. The DT880, which can be notoriously sharp and sibilant in its treble, sounded smooth and well controlled on this one, and it had a fair amount of low end extension and grunt on it as well. The HD6XX, which we typically say really lights up on an OTL tube amp in this price, which I mean, we say that for reasons, it does. This one may not quite bring the HD6XX to life in the way that like a bottlehead crack with a speedball upgrade can do, but it's not far behind either. It really does kind of help flesh out some of the low end power and some of the high frequency extension and all of that that, um, that happens on a tube amp with the 6XX. Again, this one doesn't do it all the way, but does a pretty decent job with that as well. Okay, but then like everything else that I tried in there too, like be it the, the low impedance dynamic driver Focal Radiance, sounds really good on here, really natural and that sort of thing. Um, and then like just the, everything else, all of the other planars, even the, the E3 and all of those high fi mins, they just, they sound really good on here. So it's a pretty uh, uh, headphone friendly amplifier as well drives most of what's out there in the headphone range that's gonna be priced around a point where you might be tempted to plug um, that your headphone into this thing. All that, it does a pretty good job. So well done there. All right, the DAC modules. What did I think of those? The, uh, the Multibit 2 DAC, we'll start there because that's the one that I, I paid for and put in here, is a smoother sounding uh, of, that in the ESS, like is the smoother sounding of the two. So the multi-bit two DAC module kind of doubles down on the, on the smoothness and the laid back kind of quality of the, the amplifier here. So if you want something that's just really buttery smooth, you can get that multi-bit two module and combine it with this amp that's already like warm and smooth and laid back and thick sounding and just kind of get more of that in there. It's still fairly resolving. Um, I really liked the smoothness and like the the tonal evenness, the tonal balance of treble and the and the uh, and cymbal sounds and all that with the uh, the multi bit module in here uh, as well. And then the multi bit module like was a little bit smaller in soundstage than the ESS module is but I think it was just a little bit more holographic, did a little bit better job of placing instruments and uh, putting space between instruments and that sort of thing. And I think the vocal timbre was just a little bit stronger. 
uh, on this as well. Now it does roll off the top end a little bit too, so that it's a little bit less airy sound, which might uh, kind of aid in that, or not aid, but kind of might partially explain why it doesn't sound as big. The Multibit card doesn't sound as big as the ESS and all of that, but that's just some thoughts um, there. Um, the ESS module by comparison here, I can hold it up because it's right here. This one has a little bit more of the stereotypical ESS sound. It's a little bit brighter. It's a little bit airier. It's a little bit more energetic and lively in its sound too. And it throws a little bit bigger stage, though I don't think it's as holographic in its positional effects as the Multibit 2 card is. Okay. Um, the presentation on this, I think is a little bit, or could be, for some listeners, could be a little bit better matched than the Multibit 2 is. Again, it's a little bit brighter, so there's a little bit more air to the presentation, so that, if like if the Pietus Maximus as just an amp was just a little bit on the dark side for you, that can help a little bit with a little bit more air presence here with the ESS module. Uh, the other aspect of it is like this one is just a little bit more active and lively sounding and a little bit more dynamic from the mid bass up through the upper ranges as well. So if the Pietus Maximus is just a little bit too laid back and smooth sounding for you, maybe just a little bit too refined, this one injects just a little bit of energy and juice into it as well. So I've seen in some corners of the internet that some are saying that the ESS module, it has the better synergy with the Pietus Maximus than the Multibit uh, does too. And I, I partially agree with that. I te tend to be a listener who likes to uh, combine a more neutral and incisive and energetic forward kind of DAC with a, a smoother, warmer, laid back amp. That combination has frequently worked well for me. And in my own personal gear, that's where I've gone. Like my Hugo 2 and my Berkeley Alpha Series 2 are both like very neutral, very incisive, a little bit more detail forward. But then the amplifiers that I have really liked, the Vioelectric HPA V281, for example, and increasingly the Hi-Fi Men Golden Wave Prelude and that sort of thing, they are a little bit warmer, smoother in their sound. And so then those two kind of different sounds balance each other out. However, the the treble on this on the ESS just generally was not as tonally smooth and it was more sibilant and a little bit more fatiguing in the top end than the Multibit 2 module is. And then some people may just really like the double down on the smoothness and relaxedness that the Multibit 2 module has over the ESS. So I think that the Multibit 2 card is probably the technically superior um, card of sound between the two um, options, the two multi-bit, or excuse me, the two internal DAC card module options that you can get for the Pietus Maximus. The presentation of the ESS module, though, I think does complement the the presentation of the Pietus Maximus itself a little more comfortably and a little bit more naturally for most users. Okay, so I will put those thoughts out there about the, the two DAC modules in there. However, the amp in the, in, the, in the niche here is resolving enough and it is high performing enough that both DAC modules, both the Multibit and the ESS, bottleneck its, its uh, performance. The amplifier in here is capable of going well beyond what these two DAC modules can uh, deliver, which is why I, I went through to such lengths earlier in the video to talk about why this being single-ended is a problem, or at least having single-ended only connections is a problem. The Mojo 2 uh, DAC in here immediately sounded to better to me than either of these DAC modules. It's just a, a bigger soundstage than either of them can cast in a more holographic sense of space in there. It had even more low-end dynamics than is already impressive on the uh, Pietus Maximus. And just like the tonal weight and density of this, this here, like... The, the overall sound, the individual sounds, they just sounded more lush and full and fleshed out. They just had more meat on their bones and had a more natural sound to them as a result through the Mojo 2 than they did through either of these DAC modules. 
So if you were to step up from here to say the Socrus DAC 1421, which in my testing fairly easily outperformed the Mojo 2, and also has a little bit more like detail forward, neutral, incisive kind of sound to it, that should be, I hadn't didn't get to hear it for myself, but in theory should be a very good sonic match to the Pietus Maximus as well. All right. The uh, the Black Ice Audio Glass FX, I did not have a chance to try that pairing either. That DAC is also a little bit like warmer, smoother, and all of that most of the time. But that one you can roll tubes on it because it's also a vacuum tube device and you could in theory get some tubes in there like some Genelex Gold Lions maybe that are a little bit more detail forward and brighter and give you that little bit of more forwardness and like brighter sound and more active energetic sound that will complement the sound of this quite well also. Or you could just double down on the smoothness if that's your thing and that's fine too. The point is, the Pietus Maximus performs well enough that it really begs to be paired with an outboard DAC, and options are limited. I was asked the question by um, some of my patrons, how does the, the Pietus Maximus sound uh, when paired with Schitt's Bifrost 2 slash 64 DAC? And the answer to that question is good. It does sound good. The more complete answer is, is it does not sound as good as it should. Okay, and, and what I mean by that is like the, this is where again like the single-ended nature of the Pietus Maximus becomes a problem because as I have spent more and more time with the Bifrost 2 slash 6.4 and have re used it to review more and more gear, what I have observed is that the, the performance gap between its balanced output and its single-ended output is bigger than I initially thought. Okay, so let me bring in a couple of other comparisons and then we'll return to that point here. So let's do some amp comparisons real quick. Shit Asgard 3 has a very similar sound and sonic presentation to the Pietus Maximus. The Pietus Maximus is a more refined, more technically capable, uh, and slightly more headphone controlling. Like it just has better, has a little bit more resolving and a little bit more capable amplifier in it. So it grabs control of headphone drivers a little bit more than the Asgard 3 does. But they sound very similar. It's just that the Pietus Maximus is a more grown up, more mature, more technically capable version of the Asgard 3, basically. Here's where things get interesting. The G111 Mark II, again, 550 US dollars. This one has a very different sound than the Pietus Maximus. This one also, I have a, a, a roundup of what were $600 amps at the time. And this one, along with the Shit Liar Plus, were my favorites from that grouping. I think the Liar Plus's performance ceiling is just a smidge higher than this one, particularly when you put some tubes in it. Okay, but like for pure solid state operation, this one was the winner of that group. This one sounds different than the Pietus Maximus. It is a more neutral, new, more neutrally tuned, more aggressive, like active, lively, energetic kind of presentation uh, to it as well. Okay, but outside of that, these two are just almost dead even in terms of overall technical performance. They have about the same size, so, same size soundstage. They are almost dead even in terms of their ability to do spatial imaging and separation. They both have excellent timbre. They sound very lifelike in their sounds and that sort of thing here at the price point. Okay, they both are, they are again, just like technical equals almost. Like these both scaled way up all the way to my Berkeley Alpha Series 2 DAC. Um, and they just were really highly resolving for their price point and all that. And they were just, they were trading blows. Like sometimes I would think that the, um, the uh, G111 Mark II was like blending the, the trailing tones of a cymbal hit into the next cymbal hit just a little bit too much, but it was doing a better job on the attack of like resolving the sound of a wooden drumstick on the metal of a cymbal. 
where this one was more clearly separating the individual symbol hits, like the trailing end of one did not bleed into the leading edge of the, another, of the next quite as much, but it didn't do quite as good of a job of pulling out that sound of a wooden stick hitting a metal symbol uh, kind of thing in here. So just little tiny things like this. Were those big differences? No, but just little tiny things like that showed up in resolution on each of these with each of them resolving something that the other didn't do quite as well not a blowout in either direction, you know, about an even number of times, or equal number of times either way. So really these two scale up ridiculously well for their price, give you more and more, and they are just basically technical equals with different presentations. Again, the Pietus Maximus being warm, thick, smooth, and highly refined with a lot of sub-bass impact. The G111 Mark II being more neutral, more aggressive, lively and dynamic from the mid bass on up. It could be equally as slammy in the sub bass as the, the Pietus Maximus is. It just doesn't stand out as much because the whole range is, is dynamic and punchy and lively and that sort of thing there too. Um, this one is just a little bit brighter in comparison. The, uh, the Pietus Maximus rolls off the top end just a little bit in comparison. So when a track goes sibilant, it's a little bit more noticeable on the G111 Mark II than it is on the Pietus Maximus, but again, not by a lot. Okay, so they are essentially equals just with different sounds. Okay, it really is that simple. Let's come back to the Bifrost 2 for a moment and why, why that's important. Because if you connect the Bifrost 2's analog outputs, or excuse me, they're both analog outputs, but single-ended outputs into each of these here and then switch back and forth between the two, that same technical equalness, same technical equality is still there. Okay? They are just dead even with different sonic presentations. But if you connect the balanced output of the Bifrost 2 into the G111 Mark II and its single-ended output into the Pietus Maximus, and then adjust the volume knobs so that you've got uh, level matching between the two types there because the balance output is louder, okay? it has a higher voltage output. But when, you, when I would uh, volume match those things and then switch the headphone back and forth between the two amps, then I very clearly heard the G111 Mark II pull ahead. Even bigger soundstage yet, even more holography, even more overall resolution, even more um, natural timbre, even more dynamics and liveliness and that sort of thing to the sound there. Like it clearly took a step ahead. So can I recommend the Bifrost 2 be paired with the Pietus Maximus? No, I can't, which is unfortunate because they have the same chassis and they stack well with each other. But the Bifrost 2 is $800 anymore. And if you're only going to connect it via single ended connection to this, you are not getting the $800 of performance that you paid for, period. You're not. Okay. So that's that's one reason why this not having that balance input is kind of difficult when, you know, something very close in price has it right there. Okay. Um, so going forward, I think the niche team needs to address that. Um, again, moving forward. Okay. Real quick. What about the Pietus Maximus compared to like the next tier up of amplifiers, the Vioelectric HPA V222 and the Shit Molnir 3? Those two amps, both of them are easily technically superior to the Pietus Maximus. So this one does not reach up in terms of its entire sonic package and trade blows with those two and make those $1,300 amps a stupid purchase because you could get this, the, you know, just as good a sound at $500. That's not the case. The refinement of this one is probably comparable to the refinement that you get from particularly the V222. Did I say too many twos? Anyway, because the, the Vio V222, the, the, the Vioelectric V200 series in general, has the warmer, thicker, smoother kind of presentation to it that the, the Pietus Maximus has. The Molnir 3, oddly enough, is the more technically capable version of this sound, okay? So the company's kind of got crossed up there. Like, I don't know if like somebody from shit went to lake people or somebody from lake people went to shit or they secretly combined and they're going to call themselves either shit people or lake shit. I don't know. Okay. 
but it's just weird how they got crossed up on their <laughs> on their like family tree in terms of sound in these lines. But the point that I'm getting at here is outside of that refinement, the the V222 and the uh, the Molnir 3 are more resolving. They have more natural timbre. They have better spatial separation in particular, so they sound a little bit more holographic okay, in their presentation and all that. And then the big thing that stands out that you get moving up to that price is the soundstage depth. The V222 and the Molnir 3 are much better than either of these two right here in terms of being able to position sounds in this dimension, right? And then to like layer them so you can see like relatively how far back they are. And that really stood out to me as the biggest single um, advantage of moving up to those $1,300 amps that you're not getting from these five to $600 amps here. So does the Pietus Maximus really reach up and challenge amps that are significantly more expensive than it? No, but is it an excellent mid-fi amp in that four to $800 range? Yes, okay, it sounds very good. It has kind of its own unique sound and presentation and skill set, if you will, there at that price. I really love the G111 Mark II. It is my reference mid-fi amp for good reason. And this one sounds different, but sounds every bit as good as the G111 Mark II. It's just unfortunate that the lack of balanced input here and the fact that these DAC modules do not ring the most out of the, uh, the Pietus Maximus as they could or as much out of it as they could make signal chain building for this one just a little bit more difficult and a little bit more, you have to be a little bit more intentional and careful about it than you um, have to be with something like the G111 Mark II. All right, but kudos to Niche. It is a really good sounding amp. I, I would like to see a, the, uh, a balanced option going forward or release your own DAC that's a really good single-ended outboard DAC that has a little bit wider decoding range and more input options on it too, um, rather than just uh, um, <clears throat> putting a balanced input on there. That would be cool because we need more single-ended DACs on the market. All right, but I will go ahead and leave it there. Excellent job. I look forward to whatever Niche comes up with next and uh, and to their future refinements of this thing because I'm sure there will be some future editions of this as well. So thanks to all of you for watching. Please like and subscribe. If you haven't yet, leave a comment down below. Check out my PayPal, my Patreon, and generally do those things you do to support YouTube channels. So again, thanks for watching, and as always, enjoy the music.